Now we come to the most controversial part. My theory of what actually happened in the 1800s and 1900s. Are you ready? Fasten your safety belts. Hi, I'm David Daniels from Chick Publications. After J.L. Hugg's book claiming Vaticanus was oldest and best, the carefully prepared paleographers bought the Vaticanus and other Egyptian Bibles hook, line, and thinker. The Vaticanus had to be one of the oldest and best, if not the oldest and best. If it was, we needed to change all our Bibles to match it. Vaticanus became the prize to seek. Everyone who was anyone wanted to get a look at it. But who had control over it? The Vatican. So anyone who wanted to see it had to make nice with Rome and not say anything or do anything that would upset them in hopes of seeing Vaticanus. It was a race and everything went to Rome. Now you have to be nice to the Pope. So none of these guys are going to try to rescue any Catholics from bondage to Rome, say the Pope is Antichrist, preach or teach against Rome in any way. Ironically, they have to act better than Catholics if they want to be allowed a glance at what they now believed was oldest and best, Codex Vaticanus. One guy who I've talked about for months was totally into that Catholic French monk Montfaucon and his science of paleography deciphering ancient manuscripts. That guy was anxious to see the oldest and best and admitted that he wanted money, a good position, and the highest praise of man. That guy was Constantin Tischendorf. There were three main Egyptian manuscripts according to the scholars, Alexandrinus, Ephraim Rescriptus, and Vaticanus. Tischendorf was too late to study the Alexandrinus. That had been done already. He needed something new to put his name on. The Catholics sponsored him to spend two years working on the Ephraim Rescriptus and erased and rewritten over Codex. They awarded him for that, and he got some scholarly recognition, but the public still didn't know who he was. It wasn't enough. Tischendorf also spent a few years doing favors for various Catholic leaders, deciphering Greek doc documents. Then he asked them to write letters to the Pope, for the Pope to let Tischendorf see the Vaticanus, the goal of his life. But as the 1800s went on, scholars started to see it wasn't enough to have just Vaticanus. They needed something else to justify the unusual readings in it, the things that were missing and the things that were changed. Then, as if by magic, poof! In 1844, suddenly the Sinaiticus appears. It has no provenance, no history of any kind. It has no chain of custody. It just showed up in a monastery that 29 years earlier in 1815 only said it had three Bibles. Now they suddenly said that they had four. Sinaiticus was the magical fourth. I've spent a lot of time building up facts, but I haven't simply spilled the beans of what I think really happened. So, this is my opinion, based on my research at this point in time. I think Tischendorf was set up. From his favorite teacher in college, they picked him out. They knew what sort of a person he was. They saw his pride, his ambition, and they decided to make it work for them. So they gave him the plum of the Ephraim Rescriptus, then they rewarded him for his work. Then, in 1843, Tischendorf was granted an audience with the Pope. He was mostly silent about it, but there are a lot of details coming out now in books and from many different sources, including Catholic ones, about what happened. I think Tischendorf got to see the Vaticanus. Then, got to see Jesuit Cardinal Mai's personal work on Vaticanus before it was published. He might have taken something of it home with him. Regardless, he learned about certain unusual readings, and he was now on the lookout for them in any manuscripts he would find. Remember, Tischendorf is credited as having found more manuscripts than almost anyone else. I wonder how many of them were really fake. I think that in that papal audience, his visit to the Pope, they told him he should go to the East to find manuscripts, 
But after this, he raised money and made a beeline to Cairo, Egypt, then to St. Catherine's Monastery. I think they tipped him off that there was something to be found there. I think the Catholics paid for monks who were up in northern Greece in Mount Athos to prepare a special text. But for some reason, it was a rush job. They worked with many manuscripts to blend them together into one big book. But they also had to have certain readings in them. I think those were set up for Tischendorf to find. That's why we found some of them only at Mount Athos. They had worked up Tischendorf's reputation. They taught him what to look for to judge a manuscript as ancient. He was totally set up for this. I think they made to order a manuscript for Tischendorf to find. They started with the Old Testament, then moved to the New at the last. We only know for sure it was finished in the form we see today by 1845. They could have moved down to St. Catharines and tried to finish stuff up in the last year or so. I say that because scraps of Sinaiticus were tossed into a little hidden chamber and only found in 1975. I think it was taking too long to make it, so they made some shortcuts. They cut out huge chunks of the Bible that didn't have major doctrinal stuff or many alternate readings. Many monks were paid good money to come up with ancient Greek manuscripts after the fall of Constantinople in 1453, and there are only so many to go around, so there were many counterfeiters. I think Constantine Simonides was one of them. I think he was employed by the Catholics through whatever intermediaries to work in this team of people. That way he and his friends, who knows, Benedict, maybe Kalanikos, a number of counterfeiters worked on this rush job of a text to get down to the monastery in the Egyptian desert for Tischendorf to find. If Tischendorf got his finances together for his trip really fast, it would make it necessary to get the manuscript down there even faster that could force some shortcuts. I mentioned mistakes, there are many. They would put up text to copy, but they'd have to go from single column, most likely in the original, and copy into four columns. That's very tricky. So they'd set down one manuscript and turn to another and keep writing. They don't have time to read it. That's how they skipped from Chronicles to Ezra and kept on writing. Not till later did someone catch it and write a couple creative notes. But all these mistakes actually worked for Rome. There were so many layers, paleographers could read Sinaiticus for a lifetime and never run out of theories. And they'd been indebted to Rome for it all. And did anyone notice? They abandoned the preserved Bible for all of this. I think Protestant scholars had a vested interest in believing Tischendorf's date of 350 AD. And then they could teach it to their students down on to today, deceiving Christians into thinking that God didn't actually preserve his words. They think that we have to have priests, I mean, textual scholars, to tell us which words might be God's and which words might not be. I think Tischendorf didn't know he was being duped at first. He may have seen the book, yes, book, just like it was clearly described the next year in 1845, and cut out two portions, just like an ordinary thief, thinking he got away with something. He didn't know he was falling into Rome's plan. Then Tischendorf didn't let people get too close to the pages he removed. They had such errors. So, he just wrote out his own Codex Frederico Augustanus, CFA, printing up which Greek he thought belonged in the text. Then he put all the other stuff into end notes and told why he thought they didn't belong. People didn't see the CFA, they only saw Tischendorf's book. So they simply read it and believed Tischendorf. Rome was delighted. They awarded him and every paleographer who agreed that these were indeed ancient manuscripts. I read a bit of a letter he wrote before going back to the monastery in 1853. He knew it was a whole Bible and wanted it for himself. He was willing to get Russian help to do it, since Russia was over the monastery. Okay, I have to skip a lot here. Let's jump to the third visit in 1859. 
I think he thought he had a great find, maybe through the 1840s. But at the latest date, when he got the Sinaiticus to Cairo in 1859, he figured out it was a fake. Maybe before, but at least by then. It was too new. It was supple. And it was white. So, he came upon a plan. He darkened Sinaiticus with maybe lemon juice, like Simon Lundy's friend said he did. I have to say, if Simonides made it all up and his friends are imaginary, it is amazing that they said stuff that I only discovered starting in 2014, and people in general can only check starting in 2009. I think Simonides was a very good con and liar. He would admit the truth only when he had no other option. When Tischendorf claimed he had the oldest and best Codex Sinaiticus in 1862, Simonides was forced bit by bit to admit a little of the truth. So Simonides, or one of his friends, saw Tischendorf claim he was cleaning the pages, but actually he was aging them to look older before he went to Russia with Sinaiticus and people could see it up close. Tischendorf and Simonides knew each other. There's more to that story. And there is an accusation that after Simonides disappeared, he and Tischendorf pulled off another con, maybe in Russia. Simonides didn't want Tischendorf taking away his glory. He'd worked on it himself, so he came out and brazenly said he was the author of Sinaiticus, and it wasn't old. It was a special project and gift for the protector of the monasteries. A bunch of half-truths. Later, he modified the story to say it was more of a draft copy, another half-truth. I'd still say rush job. I think they wanted it to be the one and only copy, but they were rushed by someone and were sloppy. And again, I think that fit into Rome's plans. Tischendorf went into one rage after another. Simonides pushed all his buttons. I think Simonides had an amazing ability to divide any group into two opposing parts, or take any critic and get him to say at least one manuscript was real, even if all the others were fakes. He was that good of a con. He disappeared as fast as he appeared in 1867, and with yet another story to make nobody want to look for him, saying he died among lepers. Tischendorf's analysis and date were pretty much accepted by the scholars. Sinaiticus was now oldest and best. He got award after award. He got some money, some position, and he got to spend some more time with... Drum roll, please. Oh! Vaticanus. In 1867, he published Vaticanus, his prize. That was just what Westcott and Hort needed. They took both Sinaiticus and Vaticanus and made them the determiner of their magical oldest and best Greek text. Despite all the protesting about changes, Westcott and Hort's text is still pretty much the same as the newest one you find out today. That became the revised version, and the Bible version mill was started, which still churns out new disagreeing Bibles to this day. What does Rome get out of all this? They want people believing the Alexandrian texts are the best. Alexandrian texts have the Apocrypha, so the oldest and best texts, they say, have the Apocrypha. A Bible with Apocrypha switches you to a Bible with so many contradictions, you must trust your priest. That sets the stage for One World Bible. The One World Bible will have, one, an Alexandrian critical Greek text, two, a critical Hebrew text modified by other ancient discoveries, including Septuagint readings. And the Hebrew Masoretic text will be put down and maybe taught to be worse than the Septuagint. And three, it'll have the Apocrypha with the contradictory unscriptural doctrines that are so important to Roman Catholicism. By the way, that's already happening right now. The stage will be set. That's why it was so important in 1966 for the United Bible Societies to require that any new Bible translation project in the world can be stopped and the Apocrypha added simply by Catholics in the area asking for it. Satan got what he wanted. 
But it's a Bible. Yes, but it's not God's Bible. It's man's Bible. Satan has gotten all but the stick in the bud, jot and tittle King James Bible people and a few other translations in other languages like this to come over to Rome's Bible. Satan doesn't care what Bible you read in English as long as it isn't the King James Bible. To add insult to injury, Satan has started pushing the King James Apocrypha, giving it false importance and pushing it on King James Bible believers to get them to accept the Apocrypha. Anything to get them away from God's words, to lower God's words, and to lift up man's words. This is a conspiracy. The Catholic system and the text critics have conspired to take down a king, the King James Bible. They ridicule anyone who trusts the King James and are happy to try to destroy their reputations if they ever turn from the so-called critical text. The goal is to get everyone to let go of the King James Bible. They want them to accept a contradictory and confusing text. They want you so confused that you have to ask a scholar or a priest to tell you which to believe and which to doubt. Ultimately, they want you to accept a new Bible that is coming, a Bible that all the scholars will agree on, complete with Apocrypha. One world Bible for one world religion. That's my theory. God bless you, and have a wonderful day.